today's uh, program is a collaboration with the Pointer uh, Journalism Fellowship here at Yale and, and the Frankie Program. Of course, the Frankie Program is brought to us by uh, uh, the generous gifts of uh, Rich and Barbara Frankie. Um, today's uh, talk is by David Dobbs. Uh, David writes uh, features and essays for the New York Times, National Geographic, Slate, The Atlantic, Nature, and other publications. He's now uh, working on his fifth book called The Orchid and the Dandelion, about how genes and culture uh, generate temperament and behavior uh, in humans. The book expands on ideas uh, explored in a much-discussed feature article in The Atlantic, uh, The Orchid Children, uh, and The Social Life of Genes, recently published by Pacific Standard. Uh, David is the author of four previous books, including uh, My Mother's Lover, a number one best-selling Kindle uh, uh, work, uh, and he comes to us from uh, Montpelier, Vermont. David. Thank you very, very much for coming and for having me. Special thanks to the Frankies for helping sponsor this talk along with the Pointer Program. Uh, I received via, uh, an invitation via Carl Zimmer. Um, it's a small world. Turns out Rick, a good friend of his, uh, is a good friend of mine up in Montpelier, the birder Brian Pfeiffer. And I w was not born into the Yale family. I did not go to Yale. Uh, I went to Oberlin, but I married into the Yale family. I married a Yalie and, uh, who's not here today. But, so therefore, I think I can take a family pleasure in announcing, uh, well, I I'm not announcing the news, but in sharing some good news from the Yale family and that uh, attending the talk today is uh, someone who twice scanned my brain, told me I had a hole in it twice. Uh, and this is Joy Hirsch, who sits in the front row. And her big news for the week is that her husband, Jim Rothman, won the Nobel Prize in Medicine two days ago. I'm really honored that she's here with us. <laughs> yeah. So, so very happy news and a, a, a fine environment to consider uh, how genes and environment shape behavior and how to write about this very slippery new field. Uh, in a way, this talk is about um, two or three fields in a state of crisis, uh, confusion, regrouping, big transitions. One of them is genetics, which is, I think, fair to say, still regrouping, trying to find a steady stance uh, when in the aftermath of the Human Genome Project, which showed us that it, you know, the, the line from switch to light bulb was not going to be nearly as uh, distinct as we had hoped pre-genome project. Uh, another area is the study of behavior in general, which is kind of a a his, has a haunted history, a lot of crackpot ideas, a lot of really good ideas, some ideas with a lot of good evidence under them, other ideas with only a little bit of good evidence under them, other ideas with none at all underneath them. And, and then what happens if you're stupid enough to write about behavioral genetics at this time when all these fields are in crisis? Because the third field that is in disruption right now, and I think needs to think as hard about reshaping itself as the others, is writing about behavior, which uh, most of my writing is, is about how behavior is shaped and about ideas about behavior is shaped. Um, so first I'm going to describe an idea I ran across four years ago when, uh, well, I'll walk you through it. Now this is um, the basis of, of this book that I'm writing, The Orchid and the Dandelion. And the, the basic idea here, I ran into it at a, at a conference four years ago. Uh, yeah, four years ago. And um, in two talks, one by a child psychologist who described dynamics in children that I'll elaborate on in a minute, fitting this hypothesis. and then by a primatologist who described some of the same things, kind of converging lines of evidence you like to see. And the idea behind this hypothesis, which one of the researchers coined the orchid dandelion hypothesis, is that uh, humanity is distinguished by a range of response to 
uh, our environments, to our experience. Where at one end of this spectrum are what s Swedish distinction, uh, vernacular distinction, calls dandelion children. These are children and people who, no matter what their luck in life is or what their experience is, what kind of soil they grow up in, they're going to turn out about the same. It's not to say they'll be unremarkable, but what they were meant to be, so to speak, they'll be. They're not relatively unruffled. These are the people who we'd say everything rolls off their backs, right? So this is at one end of a spectrum. At the other are uh, orchid children who are highly sensitive to their environments. Um, and whereas the dandelion will, uh, you know, do about the same if they're in a sidewalk crack or a garden or a greenhouse, the orchid will be highly sensitive to its, its uh, environment experience and will wilt in the sidewalk crack, do okay in the garden, and the greenhouse, its own type of greenhouse, will uh, make grow into something extraordinary. So a range of sensitivity, and these are types at either end of a spectrum, of course. Uh, this, this idea was, uh, the phrase was coined by this researcher, Thomas Boyce, who's at Berkeley now, was at Berkeley and then UBC, British Columbia, and then back to Berkeley, a, uh, psych a uh, pediatrician who got into studies of children and saw that kids um, that were very reactive to their home environments were also very uh, reactive in phys various physiological measures and also showed in their health outcomes. They're more likely uh, to have worse asthma attacks than someone without this sort of sensitivity. And another researcher, um, Jay Belsky, who's on the right there uh, with a, a colleague of his, and I don't know who the infant is. It's not theirs. Um, I, I'm assuming because they, they just work together. Um, <laughs> But uh, Jay Belsky came at this idea from a more evolutionary standpoint. He wondered uh, why. He, he had seen in the literature and in, in various uh, research he did that the same kind of range. And what struck him, the first clue, was that the kids who were the most temperamental by child development measures of temperament uh, seemed to be the ones that got the most out of Better, the better childhood interventions. So the kids who seemed most in trouble because things were bad at home gained the most, it seemed to him, from you know, successful interventions. Uh, so they both developed this over, over the years. And this is the, the basic outline of this, um, this idea. And this is, in a sense, so it was first a, a statement about temperament, and then it became tied to a body of genetic research that came out of psychiatric uh, genetics that looked at a handful of genes that in many studies, not all that looked into it, but in many studies were associated with mood and behavioral disorders like depression, a serotonin transporter gene. There was a variant of it. If you had it, you were more prone to depression. There was a variant of a dopamine processing gene, DRD4, that was associated with hyperactivity, uh, antisocial behavior, things like that, and a handful of other genes that were considered risk genes for these mood and behavioral disorders. And Th this, that risk gene hypothesis was, became the dominant one between its emergence in the mid to late 1990s and about, well, through the 2000s. Uh, and what it looked at was, here's the, the negative environment and the, you know, the, uh, the, the, the bad gene, the risk gene at the bottom, and you got this kind of curve. The worse the environment, the uh, worse the outcome, if you had that gene. So the gene didn't make you more itself, didn't matter unless you had a bad environment. Then you had a higher statistical risk of suffering whatever the problem was, whereas the people with the other variant of whatever gene was in question ran more along a line like this. This is kind of the model of it. It doesn't represent any direct data. So this is the risk gene model. It's, it's focused on dysfunction and bad in, in bad environments because they're they're psychiatrists, so what makes people sick? Now, the, the orchid dandelion hypothesis is different, as I described it, right? It's not about just a downside. There's an upside to these same genes. It recasts things like this, OK? It's a, a matter of, are you more susceptible to your environment, more responsive, more sensitive to it? And this dotted line describes the data that it would posit. And if you look in 
the literature from the psychiatric risk gene literature, again and again and again, what you see are these crossed sticks, the non-risk gene version running more or less flat in response. Um, I mean, everyone's subject to environment. These are relative measures. And the people with the risk gene do worse in bad environments and better in good environments. Can everyone hear me OK, even when I leave the mic? OK. It's usually not a problem. So th there's a handful of genes. This DRD4 with two things, and, and one called MAOA, a serotonin transporter gene, a few others. We won't go into the weeds with which ones, but this is the model, OK? And it became rapidly became very influential in, uh, in child development and psych psychological circles. And it has some implications you can see right away. If you, because these are tied to traits. I mean, you can think of the genes as sort of proxies for traits in a sense. Um, and the traits, what's, what's very clear and pretty much incontrovertible from the literature is that humans do have a range of sensitivity. Some people are more sensitive to experience than others in all kinds of measures, EEGs, blood cortisol, measures of behavior, and that that is a neurobiological sensitivity, range of sensitivity that varies. So the extra layer here, that the part that's not quite as firmly established, that's not incontrovertible, is the genetic add-on, okay, that it's tied to this handful of genes. Where is this seemingly native variation in temperament? But what you get when you look at these studies again and again and again is what I call, just for myself, this, this crossed stick graphs. And I'm not going to go through and tell you, you know, read every slide to tell you what, but these are different measures of genes against environment. And again and again, you'll see the flatter graph uh, line is associated with the non-risk gene and the steeper slope. This is serotonin transporter gene. Um, if you have SS, like I do, um, this is your world, right, by the theory. Um, and you see it again and again in all these different uh, genes and measures. So this is, I think, a DRD, no, it's, it's uh, the serotonin transporter gene again. Here's one associated with, uh, uh, yes, MAOA and violence and antisocial behavior later. Here's another one. You can read it better than I can, another MOA. A bunch of these, and again and again, you see the same sort of cross stick. This one's a little more confused because there's four measures. It's, this was significant because it was an experimental forecast where they actually tested the environment with a, uh, tested this theory with hypothesis with a change in the children's environment and saw that the kids with the risk genes, the plasticity genes, sensitivity genes, orchid genes, whatever you want to call them, they did indeed benefit more from the intervention uh, that, that helped families know how to deal with very, very difficult children. The most difficult children in the country of the Netherlands. <laughs> so, along with this what go, is another layer that was first pushed by Belsky, uh, which is, okay, there's a bunch of these genes, a handful, you know, six, ten, everybody has their short list but there's five that show up, five or six that show up consistently in the literature, and that the more of these you have, the more plastic you'll be, the more responsive to your environment. So this would be your prediction, right? This is what the graphs would look like from that, the prediction of that multigenic uh, additive hypothesis. And he did a couple of studies. There need to be more. They can always be bigger. These are several hundred people. That's um, kind of a lot. A whole genome person would tell you, huh? You're not getting started. Um, so here's the result from one of the first ones that, uh, that Jay Belsky compiled. And oh, there was another one that I guess I cut out. But there's, uh, there's two or three of these studies now that, that answer this question, that support the idea that as, these, as you have more of these, you're more sensitive and responsive to your environment. They also offer an answer. I'm not saying it's the right answer, but they offer an answer to a big problem that has bedeviled the candidate gene, risk gene hypothesis, which is that a lot of times people will do one of these candidate gene hypothesis uh, uh, experiments. They'll cast a change or a uh, state of environment against a gene variant, and they won't find an effect, this, this cross stick. Both tr sticks will be the same. Now, that could be because the whole candidate gene hypothesis is bunkum, or what else could it be for? This is one possible explanation, because you see here that if with zero or one of these alleles, 
there's no effect in this one study and in, an, in another one like it. But when you have two, that's when you get the, the cross stick. So in all those other studies, which were in single genes, the ones that showed up were the ones that probably, perhaps, had two or more of these alleles to make them more responsive and kind of um, show up on the, on the graph, as it were. Uh, so there's a, a bunch of other um, evidence that, that folds into this. This is, the, this is the results of an experiment that uh, the Leiden team in Leiden, Netherlands, a very, very lovely town, um, did that found that the kids that were most at risk and were doing the worst and had this risk gene, uh, their bad behaviors dropped the steepest from the in intervention. And in a lasting way, the follow-up was, if I remember, about a year after the end of the intervention. So it stuck with those families. Now, one possible confound is, well, the mothers, maybe they had a genetic makeup. They, didn't, they haven't filtered that out yet. Uh, so this is the idea that there's a handful of genes formerly seen as risk genes. They're, they're getting recast here as sensitivity genes. It's not about risk. It's about possibility. It's not about vulnerability. It's about responsiveness. And um, you can see this can change your view of the traits that, and perhaps the genes that make one vulnerable to stress, trauma, that make you more likely to dive when things are really going badly. If, if you think of those only as weaknesses, you're in one sort of state of self-conception. I don't mean that in a dirty way. But um, if, you, if you see it as, no, I, I, there's an upside here too. Because if this is really about response to environment, I will respond better to the good things in the environment. And you might actually feel a heightened sense of agency, more control over your life and your mood under the, uh, under the premise that you can change your own environment and you will, you will rise with those efforts. All right, so this is just one implication. There are others about um, evolution. Some of these, uh, there's no iPhone. Um, some of these theorists think and some anthropologists think that uh, perhaps this wide range of response to environment and the variation in range and response to environment that these genes confer on humanity may be part of the reason, along with many other assets, that we're so successful as a species. Not so good at governing, but um, you know, we've covered the planet in a way that is uh, unusual. And this is ideas given some support in some eyes by the fact that many of these polymorphisms, these genes that took on a second form, the plasticity gene, these plasticity variants emerged in uh, Homo sapiens, most of them in the last 40 to 80,000 years, which corresponds to the time period in which we have colonized the entire planet, you know, moved out of Africa and did whatever we did to the Neanderthals and took over the world. Um, now, there's that's one line of evidence, or several. There's also physiological lines of evidence about the power and that uh, serotonin, in particular, plays roles in social in response to social uh, environment. When grasshoppers become locusts, for instance, it's the the signal that drives that change is crowding and food, but it's mainly a crowding thing. It's a it's a social change in social environment, as it were. And that creates a sharp spike in serotonin that fades. But that's what drives this tremendous change that changes a grasshopper into a locust. It's the same animal, but you know, I used to actually think they were different animals. You could be forgiven because they look different. They, you know, one has longer uh, limbs, and the, and the, the uh, locust has a bigger head to contain a, a rapid uh, growth of the brain, presumably to negotiate this complicated high stakes world you're suddenly in as a locust where like if you go too slow, the guy behind you eats you, stuff like that. Um, so, and uh, there's another line of evidence that's quite um, compelling and that is the work of a guy named Stephen Sumi. How many are familiar with Stephen Sumi's work? How many people have heard of Harry Harlow? Okay, and that line of work. Um, Stephen Sumi was um, one of Harry Harlow's uh, students and proteges. And th the work he does at NIH, not this week, 
um, <laughs> carries forth uh, s Harlow's essential investigation into what? The, the creation of temperament, right? This is a Harlow, it's a very stark, sometimes upsetting experiments looked at. How does early experience shape temperament? What makes a really nervous monkey? What makes a successful monkey? And Sumi has continued this line of work using a paradigm that, that Harlow developed originally, actually, where some monkeys are raised just either early uh, weeks and months just together with other monkeys their age. Peer, this is the peer-raised group. And uh, then other monkeys who are just raised, as usual, by their moms. And uh, in rhesus live in matriarchal, matrilineal groups, Right, little kind of troops that are made up of um, uh, families organized around matri lines, so mother, grandmother, and so on. And the young grow up at about a one to four ratio compared to humans. So a four-year-old rhesus is roughly equivalent to a 16-year-old human. Got it? Um, the moms give birth every year, usually to one child. Daughters stay with that group and start mating at about four years, four to six years. Sons leave at about four years, live a while in all male gangs, and then try to work their way into a new troop. This is a really high risk time for the young males, um, as I'll explain in a minute. So anyway, the peer reared monkeys, um, uh, they're, they're nervous little animals. And when they, at, at, after a few months, they join the larger group, they remain nervous. Their social skills are, are poor. They, 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 they bite, they, they don't know how to respond to signals, they, they misread them, um, and they don't integrate very well into the very hierarchical, uh, complicated social system that is rhesus monkey life. Whereas the other monkeys, uh, the mother rays, you know, almost by definition, are normal. Most of them do well, and they learn how to fit in and create alliances through grooming and contributing to uh, this, this family-based troop. And they're valued and allowed to be around a little longer if they're males. And uh, the males, those males tend to be more successful um, working their way into new families. Because half in that year where they're all in, on their own, half the males die. Because they get killed in fights with, in their own group or with other young male gangs. Or when they try to get into a new family group, they go amiss or choose poorly and they're killed in that transition or they're shunned by their social, their little all-male gang and tend to be on the periphery and they get eaten by something. Um, you don't want to be alone if you're a rhesus monkey any more than you do as a human. So those were the norms from those two things but Sumi was seeing early on, way back, that about 20% of the mother race monkeys turn out not so great. About half of them were neurotic monkeys, sort of like the peer rays. And about another half were bullies, poor social schools, uh, skills like some of the peer rays. So they got in fights they shouldn't have got in. They failed to take cues from older monkeys, so they got beat up. Uh, and when they went out to join these, um, these all-male gangs, they were often shunned and didn't make it. Some, some of them took too much risk jumping in trees, literally, and would fall to their deaths. So when about a decade ago, Sumi could get a hold of genotyping, you know, it got cheap enough and quick enough to genotype a lot of these monkeys. He found, lo and behold, you see this coming, that uh, these monkeys that seemed more sensitive to the mother's environment, the mother raised monkeys, uh, that they were part of that 20%, that they tended to be, uh, to carry uh, the, the short version of the serotonin transporter gene, which this monkey has and almost no other primate has other than humans. So, uh, and it was just, they just simply had a bigger reaction. If they had a neurotic clinging mother, they tended, or a harsh mother or a neglectful mother, uh, they tended to have trouble. And if they had a, a competent mother, they did actually better than most of the other monkeys. Um, so extremely interesting line of work that folds in. Uh, when he looked around, he started asking his friends to, uh, in the primatology community to to uh, genotype their monkeys, and uh, there's hardly any other primates with even the serotonin. There's one or two uh, other than us, and there, there's, whereas the um, rhesus have several of these polymorphisms of, you know, sensitivity genes, uh, none of the other primates seem to have, that have been genotyped enough to know, have uh, multiple of these. So this increases his faith in this idea. 
Um, so that is this really very powerful um, idea that I ran across at this conference four years ago. And how should one write about this? Okay, this is, this is a very powerful idea. People who encounter it, um, I mean, I got a lot of emails from people when this thing, I wrote an article <coughs> in the Atlantic, as Richard noted. <coughs> I've never gotten any kind of response close to the response I got to publishing this thing there. I got tons of email ask, people asking me how could they get genotyped, and this, this resonated, you know, described her, their sister perfectly, or their mom, or themselves, or their kids. And, you know, oh, I got, you know, they would say, their, I, got, well, I got a dandelion here, I got an orchid, You're, this is how this works. So, how to write about this? Well, you know, one option, which was the, is, is, is do it as fast as you can, and simplify this problem, this idea, and overplay its security in the scientific world and make it the thing that explains everything, right? Now, because there's a really well-established genre, right? This is much of pop behavioral writing. It's a whole genre of books that I call, drawing partly on the title of one, which is called How We Decide, uh, that I call How We Behave books. And they purport to explain how we behave. Now, this is a very interesting thing to study. And it's an important thing to understand as best you can in life, because you know, it's important to understand how other people behave. But to pretend that science has figured this out with deep authority uh, so that you can write a book that's essentially a cookbook or a self-help book is misguided, will be kind. Um, and you know, you're seeing this right now. I don't know if you've been reading the reviews of, uh, of Malcolm Gladwell's latest book, but there are critics who feel that he does this to extreme degree. Uh, Christopher Chabri, or Chabris, a psychologist, um, wrote a devastating review of Gladwell's latest book in uh, the Wall Street Journal. He said he excels at cherry picking science, science to tell just so stories. That's a close paraphrase. Um, and so he had then uh, posted his own blog site that was even more damning. And as he points out, uh, and as you can hear, Gladwell's defense here is that he's using these studies to augment his storytelling. And as Shabri and many others have pointed out, well, he's not augmenting his stories with this science. He's, this is the foundation of his storytelling. And if that's the case, I think, you, you know, you need to be careful, and the accusations on Gladwell is that he's not careful. Um, so the Atlantic's Ta-Nehisi Coates, a wonderful writer, he had, was fun, uh, pondering the downfall of um, another writer in this genre, Jonah Lair, who fell because of fraud. He, he fabricated uh, quotes, including one by Bob Dylan, which was the thing that brought him down. Uh, <laughs> And uh, so Coates said, we now live in a world where counterintuitive bullshitting is valorized, where the pose of argument is more important than the actual pursuit of truth, where clever answers take precedence over, precedence over profound questions. We have no patience for mystery. We want the deciphering of gods. We want oracles, and we want them right now. I think he's spot on here. But if you write in this world and you, there's just tremendous pressure on writers to fit this model because it sells like crazy. Um, so what's wrong with doing that? Well, I, I've offered some offerings from others. Uh, I have my own problems. I think it ignores, among other things, the extreme, the chaos in genetics, the, uh, the tremendous uncertainty in genetics. And the immaturity, I mean, I don't mean that in a bad way, but the immaturity of neuroscience. It's a very young field. I was at the neuroscience meeting two years ago. I was at a table, there was about 10 neuroscientists there. And I thought, oh, I'll do a quick poll. And I said, if zero is complete ignorance, we don't even know where the brain is, and 100 is like perfect, you know, working knowledge of it so that we can answer any question about how it works, where is neuroscience right now? All the answers almost all the, but one, we're in the single digits. Six, eight, nine, this is from neuroscientists. These aren't cynics, these are neuroscientists. One person said, 11. Um, and this is where it is, yet we take these findings and we say, oh, we figured out 
how we do this, how we behave. We, we, we got the answer, and I can tell you how to run your business based on it. Uh, so we need to quit treating these, these are puzzles, these are mysteries, and we need to quit treating them as settled pictures. Because um, science it just is not that neat. And so um, this has given me pause as I've worked on this book and dug in and talked to people, uh, trying to figure out how do you write about this stuff. And I think it can help to, um, to think about genre, right? If they're offering cookbooks and how-to books and self-help books, maybe we need to think of, you know, go to a different part of the bookstore when we write and uh, read these books. Maybe more proper genres are uh, detective stories or mysteries. Now look, for instance, at a book that's not about behavioral science, but it shows some of the things, there's no reason you can't do this about behavioral science. And that is, um, I'm going all Eli today. That is David Quammen's Spillover. This is a book about uh, zoonoses, uh, diseases that animals that move from the animal, spill over, as they say, from the animal kingdom into humanity. And a lot of the scary diseases we're worried about lately are, are these diseases. They spill over, They're, they become SARS, flu, uh, and so on. And he writes this lovely book about the scientists who are trying to hunt these things down. Now, what is this? This is a, this is a whodunit. This is a what done it. What are these things that are killing us? How do they get here? How did they show up? Where did they, how did they get from that cave to this little girl that they killed? And it generates this delicious, deep power because he doesn't try with every chapter or anecdote to resolve a mystery or question. He, he tries to explore it. He watches people explore it. He shows them explore it. He embraces constantly the mystery of where these things came from and how they spill and spread through humanity. So he's shedding light, but he's not pretending that we're seeing everything. He's shedding light and showing us that when you, when you show light, you do find some things out, but you also find more little dark holes and caves and corners where we don't know what the hell is going on. Or to use another yeah, metaphor, he's, he's sort of embracing the, uh, what I think of as the island model of um, knowledge, the growing island. So as, as we learn more, the island of what we know expands. But the border between what we know and what we don't know gets ever bigger. This is how science works, right? This is what happened with the genome big time. Like the island quintupled in size and somebody do the math for me. I was an English major. Whatever that does to the perimeter of the island, that's what it did. So. How can you, you, I think it helps to think about different genres and to think about what you can add. Where, how do you work that mystery? And what else do you get when you admit the mystery that you don't get if you deny the mystery? Well, one thing you get is, um, and this, this is a little, I get a bonus having joy come because if you think of this in terms of winning the Nobel Prize, it really throws us into relief, is this, frightening level of commitment that a scientist, a good scientist must and does bring to her work, right? This is, you know, hardly anybody gets to win a Nobel Prize. Hardly anybody gets to put down, leave work that is drawn on even 10 years later heavily, that's foundational to their discipline 10 or 15 years later. Very few their work is you know, indispensable for 25 years, and a tiny few, 50 or 100 years. And even the ones whose work, the Newtons and Einsteins and Darwins, their work gets revised. It doesn't get thrown out and replaced. It gets elaborated. There are holes found in it that must be worked on. Nobody gets it completely right. You never have this final answer, and most people get to leave no mark, discernible mark at all. It's like being a poet, right? Um, but they go to work every day, and they try to do this. And this is a noble thing. And they also go to work today with people down the hall who hate them, and there's rivals across the country who are dying to kick their ass, and there's people in their department who doubt what they're doing, there's trouble at home, they ha they're living lives. This is, this is hard work. And if, you, if it's all a neat little just-so story, you're missing 
all of this opportunity. Now, so what am I going to do with what's been presented to me? Well, you've got to wait for the answer for that until I finish the book. I don't want to give away too much. But, you know, my first step, it was funny. I, I run into this idea. It's a very entrancing idea. And I see the reaction people have to it. And I'm talking to geneticists of every stripe. And, you know, I'm talking to geneticists who go, do you know how many problems there are with this body of literature? And they tell me. And now I know. And I'll offer to them. You know, you can, you can talk with them all day. And I could get all the people who believe deeply, the scientists who believe deeply in this, and together with the doubters. And it would be a very interesting conversation. And I realized this is so obvious that immediately as you say it, it's so obvious you feel stupid you never saw it. I don't have to adjudicate this debate. Who am I to even think of adjudicating this debate? And this points out the arrogance of deciding, like the, the hubris of people who say, well, this is how it works. The people working on it don't even know how it works yet, but they're trying to figure it out. And this, this search simultaneously with the, you know, side by side with the power of these ideas, is that not rich enough? Of course it's rich enough. It's just harder to write about. You've got to find ways to make assets. I liked, this was the second realization, and I liked it because it was resonant with the theme of the, these genes, right, these traits, is I had to make a, I had this conflict. I had to make an asset of the conflict. And that's a plotting problem. That's, that's a structural problem. That's a writer's problem. And instead of just ignoring this conflict and the friction that this idea faced, I can exploit that. I can embed it in the reader. So what kind of experience do you end up with if you read a book like this? If someone can write a book like this? I hope I can. You are making real the excitement of these ideas so that you understand how exciting they are to the people that pursue them. You can make real and compelling opposing ideas so that watching them in opposition raises the kind of tension and mixed feelings that you know a baseball fan gets watching a really good World Series where you're not you know, married to either team. You, like, you don't know who you want to win. You can show the reader what drives these people and how much is at stake for all these scientists. And you can leave the reader with a sense of not just science's possibilities and beauty and its power, but also its its uncertainties and its limits. And if you can find the story of a regular person, a lay person to tell, who has also confronted these ideas and takes it into her own life and head because it changes the way she thinks about the fragility that has riven her family, you have another layer that you can offer the reader. And what do you get when you close a book like this? Here I think of the novelist Georges Simenon. Anybody read this? Is the, these are the, the wonderful Jules Magret, pardon my terrible French, uh, novels. The French detective, Parisian detective. Um, what did these, he wrote these things in about 20 minutes or something. But there, there's 50, there are 40, 50, 60 of these. They're all wonderful. And he's a smart man, clever, persistent as hell. He's like, um, sort of like Columbo. Remember Columbo, some of you? Remember Columbo, that it's a wily detective, only he eats much better food because he's in Paris. Um, and McGrath, he always gets his man or his woman. He gets them every time. But the entire, and how does he get them? The whole time, he's trying to answer the same questions Stephen Sumi is trying. Like, what? Me? people behave. Who among my suspects is the one who seems most likely to have done the things that this murderer did? He's trying to figure out human nature and behavior. 
And when he gets to the end, he doesn't pat himself on the back and tell himself he knows everything. These stories draw as much meaning from McGrath's mystification as from the arrest at the end. And when it's over, we see that our detective, our hero, he has solved one mystery, who done it? But he remains confounded by a deeper, far more important questions of human nature, cause, chance, and epistemology. He's more confused about the big picture than ever. And he knows, well, this is, this is my life. I'm gonna solve crimes and I'm gonna be in a state of increasing wonder. That's a good way to close a book, I would propose, uh, a far richer state of mind um, than the one in which we think we have the answer to how we behave. It's not a state of self-satisfied, delusory completion, but you know, a state of heightened inquisition, of a kind of ardent and humble curiosity, which I think is a far more accurate representation of science and really of how, at our best, we all think and behave. Thanks. I'm, I'd be very pleased to take questions. Yes, sir. Um, I don't know if you know there was a, a sociologist of science from 40 years ago who uh, did a study asking scientists what did they read in their leisure time? And you might think science fiction. No. Mysteries. Mysteries. Scientists read the mysteries. <laughs> and as a practicing scientist, that was about the only one who read some of them. <laughs> so that shows that it's in of one. This has to be true. You have to be a scientist. <laughs> Thank you. That's good. Yes, Tony. Okay. Um, I, I think this is an amazing, compelling uh, presentation of some of the textbooks and the science. But one of the questions that I have as I, as I listen to you is that beyond the, the mystery and the sort of the thrill of the chase that we all experience in science, there are assumptions that we make. And these assumptions are often not questioned. So let me give you an example. In the neuroscience, one of the assumptions that we make are assumptions that mind and behavior, or mind and brain, are more or less like unit. And we have linking hypotheses that link the physiology of the brain to our behavior, or our philosophy or our life. And those assumptions that brain and our, that our thinking about our problems in life are connected somehow right. are often not the kind of the things that are questioned. Right. So how and that's another level. So in your story, your I mean your proposal to make to represent science as kind of a mystery, which is yeah, yeah. beautiful. Um, how do you plan to deal with the deeper levels of these assumptions that we Uh, so you're asking in a general sense, or you're asking, am, am I going to go down the mind-brain rabbit hole? Well, I don't want to give away <laughs> any secrets, but, but this astonishing hypothesis that mind and brain are more or less a unit yeah, yeah. Is, is something that uh, we all deal with. And I think that, that you also deal with it here, but you don't have explicit about it. Or maybe you have. Oh, no, no, I haven't. I haven't really thought that I was dealing with that here, but I think implicitly I am, is what you're saying. I, I, um, I, 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 so. I am not in the context of this book, which has me <laughs> at my limits enough going to broach that question, I'm afraid. That, that, that I'm not going to... That's too bad, because yeah. <laughs> I think that that's one of the most compelling, most challenging, interesting questions out there. It, it is, it is, yeah. There's no doubt, and it, it's very confounding, yeah. yeah. No, it's funny. I mean, this is, oh, my God, my whole talk's up there. That's not good. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> that's been up there the whole time, hasn't it? Yeah. Okay. Uh, what was in there? I can't remember. Could have been a lot worse, I guess. Uh, now I completely forgot where I was. Oh, oh yes, this gets at, at um, what Janet Malcolm calls the writer's problem, is... Uh, Janet Malcolm, are you people familiar with her? She's a wonderful writer. Writes about 
anything superbly. But at the end of her book about Su Sylvia Plath, she describes going, she wants to go visit the guy who lived downstairs from Sylvia Plath in the flat in London when Sylvia Plath killed herself and left her two children up with the milk and the notes and the cookies. Um, and she goes in this guy's house, he's very old now, and she has to like go sideways down the hall because the, the hallways are lined with boxes full of stuff. Everywhere there's stacked stuff. They just, they bought pizza, they, they're simply trying to prepare the pizza, they have to clear off space in the kitchen to make prepared dinner. And she's trying to think why she feels so claustrophobic in this place. And she says, because it's like the instantiation of the writer's problem. You spend all this time collecting all this stuff, and this, this threatens to uh, annihilate you. And that the writer's problem is not what to put in. The writer's problem is what to take out so that you have a clean, a, a story, not a clean story, but I mean a lean, a coherent story. And uh, you know, that's, I think that's, that's been helpful to me, her making that point, because it, it really is. It's what you throw out. It kind of finds it. Yes, ma'am. Um, so when you, when one discovers a genetic basis for a somatic disease, it's exciting because we know that the practical implications would be to look for targeted treatments, right? Yes. And when you find the epigenetic basis for disease, for disease risk, then it's also exciting because we know that some of the practical implications are we can change the environmental factors to try to uh, decrease risk. Yes. So when we discover the genetic basis for temperament or behavior or these things are, that are not pathological or problematic in this person, what do you think the practical implications are of that discovery? I mean, like, can we do anything? Like, if these people write emails to you, like, wondering, oh, can we genotype? Like, what do they hope to do with that information? I don't know. I mean, a few I've had extended correspondence with, um, and they want, they're curious. They want, and to their credit, um, they don't take it as like, okay, well, that explains everything. It's, 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 it's more data, um, and it helps not confirm something, but just inform their thinking, and they tend to use it different ways, but they don't. I mean, the thing you see here throughout this entire literature is, and it's easy to drop and forget, is the E in those equations. The environment is always huge. As you were just, you know, when you were talking about epigenetics, oh, good, we can tweak something and change, but it's, you know, in, in all kinds of situations. Uh, so it's, it's um, I don't know what, you know, is actual about this. I, I sure don't see it as a, you know, God forbid somebody look at it as a way to select, you know, whether to abort or not or something. Because um, these aren't pathological genes, but I think it, it, it's, um, I, I don't know. I'm not good at, like, how to. Do you ever think about how your work might eventually erode free will and accountability? No, because I think this, this increases all that. This incre to me, this increases all that. This, I, I really strongly feel that. Yeah. Yes, sir. Um, since you came and promised to talk about the problem of writing about I noticed you didn't even mention epigenetics in your presentation. Correct. And I assume that's not a mistake. If you have made a decision. In this talk. In this talk? Yeah. Are you? In the book. In the book you're going to talk about. Yeah. Um, I mean. Well, that's I, another rabbit hole. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> And, um, yeah. <laughs> or it's a pile of box in, in your Yes, office. it's one of those things. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yes. Because, and, um, because the point that you're making about the, the, the enormous value of mystery in the scientific process is so crucial and needs to be heard by so many people in this room and valued that I I worry if you want to take on epigenetics, which is um, if you think the fields you're working with now are a mess, uh, that one holds so much promise and has got so many people so excited right now. Yeah. Uh, but it's at like three on the scale of one to exactly. yeah, yeah. So I, well, I, 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 let me, I, I, I will get into, there's, you've got to be careful. Um, in a limited sense, I'll talk about epigenetics in the sense of, not in the, not in the uh, heritable epigenetic change sense. Right, I'll, they'll, that'll be in there briefly to acknowledge its existence and that it has some relation with this line of work. But it's one of those things that I have to I had to decide. 
well, you know, that's for someone else to write over how. Um, there is some gene expression stuff in it. There's a, I have another art, article called The Social Life of Genes. Um, you just Google that. Uh, I don't know what page I'll find it on the right now. Um, it is about gene expression, changes in gene expression, uh, response, activity in response to changes in social. So that that might play a role in the book. We'll say that. Let's see. I think you were next. Any comments about uh, Andrew Solomon's book, Parts in the Trees? He's not a scientist. Neither am I. But uh, I haven't read it. I haven't either. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I got out of that one. <laughs> yeah. Well, I've heard about it. Uh, a lot of people are excited about it. And I, yeah. yeah, I just didn't get to it. Yes, sir. Years back, I read the article over the Atlantic. Um, I sent the link to my wife, who's a school social worker, and it made the rounds among the, the, the uh, uh, student support team, the social workers, and um, the psychologists in their school district. We all found it interesting, and, and also it resonated. It, it kind of um, was consistent with their experience. Yes, I hear it a lot from education people. And funny, uh, when you're writing about um, this field as a, as a, as a mystery, um, are you going to look at it from the perspective of people who try to use actually private knowledge in, 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 in concrete situations with, you know, with, with children? Um, and, uh, and the trial and error that goes into the, uh, the work of, uh, uh, of people who actually you know, uh, work with working children or dandelion children or children on the vast spectrum in, in between on a day to day basis? Uh, that, I'll just say that doesn't play a big role in my. Uh, Approach to this story, that, which is not to say that's not worth exploring. But you've spoken to a number of people, you've you yeah. had feedback from them. Yeah. And it seems to be consistent with their. It does. And I think this is part of the attraction of this hypothesis, especially as com in comparison to the psychiatric risk gene view, is that it, it, it seems to, um, you know, it offers to sort of reconcile science with. with common experience and, and vernacular knowledge, if you will, vernacular language. God, he's a mercurial son of a bitch. Things are either great or they're awful. Nothing affects that guy. It just rolls off. I mean, these are, these are, these are types that we've recognized for ages. And, and this, this is consistent with that, which doesn't make it all right. I mean, I think from a temperamental point of view, you, 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 you throw the genes out here, and most of this is close to inarguable. Some might offer, well, if it's that inarguable, it doesn't mean anything. But uh, it offers to reconcile things that way uh, uh, with this genetic point of view. Um, and this is why it resonates with a lot of people in education. And I think, well, this sort of answers the what do you do with this. Uh, to the practical aspects, one is it can just simply give you a little more patience with someone, a kid who is, you know, like he's either the best kid in class, he's, you know, a teacher he likes, a subject he likes, you can't stop this kid. He's great. A teacher who doesn't connect, a, you know, class that's run poorly, he bails. He flunks algebra two. My son did this. Um, and uh, this, and it gives you patience. Or, you know, <laughs> like, I, I, it helped me, like my daughter's, you know, throwing a meltdown She's four years old, and the world is ending because the seam in the back of her sock does not line up with the seam in her tights. And we, we can't get to school until we fix this problem, right? Um, but this is the same girl who, when she shines, it's like four sons, right? And so these, maybe there's this, you know, you can delude yourself about these things. But in education, I think it is valuable because, it, you know, you can realize, okay, there's something here to work with. I've got to figure it out. Yes, sir. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I used to do the magazine business. I remember, like, you know, you wonder, like, well, how scientific Americans during this year? Yeah. You know, and, uh, I, you know, if you watch all the history, it's very troubled history. No, it is, and it's like all of the media world, uh, you know, in upheaval right now because of, you know, all the changes, and you can get stuff, you know, the atomization of the ecosystem by the internet, and people write, read articles now instead of publications, and blah, blah, blah. Uh, and a different pay scale, it's, it's in huge disruption. I actually think that, um, you know, 
Carl and I, we like been on panels talking about this. This gets talked about a lot among the science writing community, but I really believe that there is more good science writing in that, around now than there ever has been. It's, it, it is, because it's not all in newspapers, right? I mean, there, there are almost no newspaper science sections. And how many were there 15 years ago? There was dozens. Every regional paper had a SciTech thing. And now there's like three. Uh, the Times and who, who else is left? Hardly anybody. But there's all these, I mean, the, the science blogosphere, blogosphere is a rich place. So Carl writes, is one of the best science writers in the world. He writes for the Times. He also writes a blog at National Geographic that he started himself, when was it? You were like a early bird, 2004, five, so yeah. Right, 10 years ago, right. Uh, then its own little site, it obscure, and then it moved to science blogs, and then it moved to Discover, and now it's at National Geographic. Um, and he's got partners, uh, you know, other bloggers that are blo putting out great stuff there. This kid, Ed Young, who's unbelievable. He's on fire. He's not a kid anymore, but I can call him that. Um, and uh, Virginia Hughes, who is also, there, there's, there's just, I mean, there's way more really good science writing being produced every week than I can even start to read. But it's harder to find it. Yeah. Anyone else? Yes, ma'am. If you go into the school, you're able to go into the school, you're able to be homogeneous. How is this homogeneous environment affecting what is occurring? I, I, the first question I had, how is the observation, the person making the observation affecting the observed? If we could change the environment, it seems that we could change, we have more diversity, things could change. But with homogeneity, and that's where nature seems to be going, I mean, our nature. Seems to be going. We don't have enough biodiversity. I, I didn't think this question. <laughs> <laughs> well, in schools, I mean, this is the big challenge in school: is to have a, a an environment that is stimulating to every child, uh, uh, but order manageable, right? I mean. I mean this is hard enough if you have two kids, right? Um, <laughs> you're raising them at home, and you got 20 in a room. This is a really hard problem. Great teachers are still the key. I recently spent a year in London, and uh, I live in Montpelier, Vermont, where the class size in elementary school is about 15. And those, they don't, how much trouble do I want to get in the school board? It couldn't get any worse, actually. Um, but the, you know, a lot of the classrooms are not orderly there. Some of them are. You know, my, Girl's teacher right now is a wonderful teacher. Uh, but we moved to London, the class sizes were 25. Uh, every other factor that is blamed for tough education here, the, uh, the, the social economic level of the students, the diversity of the students was multiplied by 18 at this school they went to in London. And this place ran like a Swiss watch. And everybody was happy. It was orderly. Um, I don't, and I don't know what to quite make of that. That was a very diverse student body. 350 families, 40 first languages spoken in the homes of those students, right? They were from all over the planet. And an orderly classroom where everyone knew what to expect and within maybe a narrower range, close attention to what each kid needed to do that, it seemed to me. I mean, we were just there a year, but it, I was impressed with the school, which gets me, I don't know where, I don't, you know, it's a hard problem. Yes, Lisa. Um, I'm interested in what environmental factors you think could potentially cause conversion. So for example, if you look at cancer cells, they can, they can actually convert status, let's say hormone receptor status, very technical you know, types of things that if you apply chemotherapy, um, certain breast cancer cells will actually convert status from hormone receptor positive to negative, or to positive to negative, by the actual application of an external um, Is that an intended effect there with Well, they're looking situation. now to see that if some of these cells actually do convert, that has implications for long-term prognosis because they're okay. showing greater responsiveness. I mean, oh, it really okay, okay. directly into what yeah, you're saying. Yeah. So they show responsiveness. So I'm interested if you see any corollary to could there be an environmental stimulus that would cause an orchid to become a dandelion, or a dandelion to become an orchid, oh, and how oh. big a magnitude, let's say if someone gets a, you know, a certain medical diagnosis or something very traumatic in their life, 
does that actually, could that cause them to convert? Some people say, well, it just brings out and magnifies what was already there. Right, could which, you, you know, can't just do that one, right? Could you actually convert status from what you Yeah, I don't know. I, I don't know. I mean, people do become more or less uh, reactive, at least behaviorally. I mean, this is part of what we do when we grow up, right? We can't, you know, my daughter doesn't freak out about her socks as often now. Um, <laughs> she's nine. Uh, <sighs> but to what degree, you know, yeah, I don't know. Through that, through that aging process, yes, yeah, some of that we try to either shape or train yeah. or teach resilience to children. It's, it's a great life skill. Right, and sensitivity doesn't, I mean, necessarily mean you have a visible, your visible behavioral response is more robust, particularly if you, you have other you know, help and gifts or whatnot in, in refashioning your behavior so that you learn to control yourself in certain situations and redirect your behavior in those. I, I, that's a tough one, Lisa, I don't know. I, I'm gonna, I'm gonna punch. <laughs> well, let's thank David, and uh, I'm sure he'll have a chance to talk to you anybody. Oh, yeah, I'll be here. Thank you, thank you.